The Milestone universe started off with a big bang. Its founders were fed up with not having control over their creations while feeling an overwhelming need to tell stories about marginalized groups and underrepresented social issues. The final product is comic book superhero stories that still hold up today and changed pop culture for the better. As always, the transcript for this essay and all of my other videos are available on my website, witsendpod.com. First off, what exactly is Milestone? Milestone Media is a company that was founded in 1993 by writer Dwayne McDuffie, artist Dennis Cowan, writer, artist, teacher Michael Davis, and reporter slash editor Derek T. Dingle. Writer Christopher Priest, while not a founder, is a big part of the foundation of Milestone. Priest designed the Milestone logo and was the driving force behind organizing the Milestone Bible, which broke down the plan for the stories and company. Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. It's uh, 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 Dennis Cowan uh, just called me out of the blue and said that, uh, uh, why don't we start our own company? And I thought he was crazy, <laughs> uh, but he wanted to have this meeting and he called me and he called a bunch of other people, including Mark Wright, who didn't show up. God bless you, Mark, which was ironic because we had our first meeting at Michael Davis's house in Jersey City and Mark lives in Jersey. It was Mark, it wasn't that long a drive. You could have showed up. Uh, <laughs> So we're all sitting in Michael Davis's kitchen and they're pitching this thing. And I think they're nuts, you know, uh, but sure, why not? And uh, we all kind of brought pieces of these characters, of the core milestone characters, you know, and Dwayne McDuffie, God bless him. Uh, he brought, you know, some of his characters. I brought characters who turned out to be Icon and Rocket. Dennis had the core idea for the Blood Syndicate and so forth. So we all were sitting around. It was like stone soup. We're throwing our ideas right. together. Uh, and then we spent the next 18 months uh, putting this proposal together. And Paul Levis was a very difficult taskmaster. So uh, we had to really learn the business. Uh, it wasn't just we can be a bunch of creative guys and they're going to give us a bunch of money. No, no, no. We have to make the money work. By the time we got to the point where DC was ready to move forward with the contract, we we're all pretty much exhausted. And um, uh, we came together and, uh, and and I said, well, I have a reservation uh, because I thought that uh, we had all contributed so much to the development of the thing, but uh, I felt, well, you know what? I, I, I'd rather not even say because I, I, I love all these guys and I, you know, and I don't want to like, you know, start, you know, any kind of odd I had a, a difference of opinion mm -hmm. with the guys. And uh, and uh, it caused a, 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 a schism where uh, uh, the guys felt like they had to, well, maybe 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 I was trying to make some sort of power play, you know, uh, or maybe they were interpreting it the wrong way. Whatever the case was, it was like, uh, you know, uh, uh, I had I had a, a disagreement and I said, well, I'm going to step back from uh, the group and. Uh, DC offered me the uh, editorial liaison uh, position. So rather than be than leave and be part of the milestone group, I remained at DC, but I was their their guy at DC. Right. Uh, so yeah, so just before that, you know, and then uh, they they came up with the milestone name because we had a very generic name. We were called Creative Partners Limited. They came up with the milestone name, and then I went home and designed that logo for them and repackaged our uh, Bible and our pitch. Uh, and, and I had written the Bible with uh, Dwayne's help, uh, but I, I was actually the, the wordsmith on the original Bible that was written by me, but Dwayne was on the phone, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and then subsequently, Dwayne expanded on and really built out that whole universe. So a lot of that ended up being Dwayne. Uh, but most of the history of the you know, the, the, the of, of the uh, that, that shared universe, the, the origins of that universe and the, the characters and locations and like that. A lot of that was was uh, was was created by me uh, during the uh, development process. The comics Milestone put out since its debut focus on black characters and other marginalized groups in their superhero universe called the Dakotaverse. They had the creative drive, but needed help getting books out to readers. A deal was made with the higher-ups at DC, like Paul Levitz and Jeanette Kahn. The deal was that Milestone Media and its founders maintained creative rights over its characters and stories, telling stories in their own way. 
DC Comics would be in charge of publishing and distributing the books, making them available to readers. These creators had worked at Marvel and DC before setting up Milestone. They knew the score. The short version is that the Milestone founders own the company and the characters. They can license the characters out, usually to DC for other projects like cartoons or crossovers, but Milestone characters are not owned by DC. While a lot of superhero debuts are cut and dry, each Milestone character has a distinct personality from the get-go. They don't feel like interchangeable costumes with similar personalities. All of them are from different walks of life with different perspectives of the world. I talked about this in the Billy Graham essay I did. Before Milestone, black superheroes were limited in scope. Outside of a character like Black Panther, they were generally street tough types with the occasional cosmic character. That said, like Justice League characters in the 60s, they had similar personalities but with different designs. Milestone pushed the boundaries of characterizations and storylines featuring black and other non-white characters. They tackled social issues like drugs, crime, abortion, police violence, and violence against minorities head-on, whereas superhero comics of the time and before handled these issues in a roundabout way. Milestone embraced its superhero roots but was dead set on tackling real-world issues without flinching. The main mystery of the Dakotaverse centers around the Big Bang. One night in Paris Island, the gang-controlled area of Dakota City, a bunch of the gangs came together for one last throwdown. Police in riot gear raided the fight with tear gas. Some civilians were caught in the mix. The people who didn't die from the tear gas were lucky or cursed enough to get powers. People with powers are called Bang Babies. Throughout the entire Milestone run, there's a whole thread of why that tear gas gave people powers. According to Dennis Cowan, Dwayne McDuffie wanted to base the Big Bang on the May 13th, 1985 move bombing in Philadelphia. Some call MOVE a black liberation group that rejected modern technology and embraced nature-based living while living in the city. The Philadelphia police bombed an entire neighborhood to get rid of the group. Eleven people died in the bombing, including MOVE's founder, Vincent Leaphart, also known as John Africa. That said, in recent years, former members of MOVE have spoken out about the group's cult-like practices. This still doesn't excuse the Philadelphia Police's actions in 1985. The event isn't explored deeply, but is just the basic inspiration for how certain characters get powers. Each title has its own identity, showing different aspects of the Dakotaverse. Hardware is a series about creators' rights and anti-corporate sentiment. Blood Syndicate is about dealing with gang violence and working together as a team. Icon is a story of immigration, survival, and using the law to help others. Static is the quintessential American coming-of-age story, but with powers. The books cover not just black identity in comics, but the identity of other minority groups as well. I will not be breaking down every single milestone title, but I will break down the four main ones. First up, Hardware by Dwayne McDuffie and Dennis Cowan. Also, Jimmy Palmiotti inked the covers for the number ones of the four initial main Milestone books. He was also a regular inker for the early issues of Hardware. My favorite Milestone character would probably be Hardware. It was the one that, um, one of the first ones that Dwayne and I came up with, all of us came up with, but that was one that was closest to who Dwayne and I were at that time, um, or who we thought we were. It was really taking that Iron Man mythos and flipping it on its head. It was also taking the idea of affirmative action and bringing it into comics and flipping that on its head. And the idea of the angry young man um, expressing himself kind of came through with hardware. So I've always gotten a kick out of that. Exciting, it just came across hardware number one. Now this was one of the four titles launched with Milestone Media uh, with Dennis Cowan and, and a whole bunch of guys, uh, uh, Dwayne. Duffy and, uh, oh, I'll think of them. But anyway, um, Dennis Cowan asked me to ink all four of the number one covers. And, and then this is the book that actually Dennis and I worked on every month for half a year, at least half a year. Um, so I'm always happy when I see this. Um, I like to say I'm the white guy from Milestone, except there was a couple more, so I can't take all that credit. Um, but yeah, this was a lot of fun to do. And uh, Dennis was a, is a very, like, He's a, he's a kind of penciler that inkers that can draw love to ink because he kind of does his pencils kind of rough and then as an inker you get to kind of tighten them up and have some funny. 
it gives you a little room to breathe as far as being an anchor. Not everybody's like that. No book establishes the message of Milestone more than Hardware Number 1 by Dwayne McDuffie and Dennis Cowan from 1993. In Hardware, brilliant inventor Curtis Metcalf destroys all of the creations he made for Billionaire Edwin Elva. This was after Metcalf learned that his ex-mentor didn't even value him as a human being while benefiting off of his work. It fits with Milestone's mission that its creators want full control of their creations and stories rather than handing them off for some corporation's benefit. We were four artists who wanted to have more control over the kind of comics that we were making. So we created a business structure to protect our artistic intent. Uh, a lot of things have been laid on top of Milestone, uh, that it was comics for black people, that it was an attempt by the man to hold down the burgeoning uh, black comic movement, which doesn't seem to have really gone anywhere since Milestone left. Uh, if we were holding them down, we did a really good job because we're now holding them down without existing. But um, basically, it was a bunch of guys who like comics, who had had a certain level of success in the mainstream and wanted to take some of that and, and kind of make our own projects. I mean, we still enjoyed working on mainstream Marvel and DC comics, but we wanted to make our own thing and control it and, and have total say over it. This is the comic that started it all. The first issue of Hardware is a perfect first comic, not only in terms of name, story, and design, but the message it presents. It's not just about breaking through the glass ceiling for the character. It's Milestone's mission statement, and the first comic the company put out in 1993. Issue 1 starts with a flashback of Curtis talking about a bird he had as a kid. The bird knew only how to live in a cage its whole life. Hardware doesn't want to be caged and fights to break free from the control of corporate overlords. The whole idea of the caged bird has been a constant theme from the beginning of Milestone all the way to the newest stories. Curtis Metcalf himself isn't much of a hero in this series either. Hardware doesn't go by a no-killing rule, and this is mentioned throughout the run. If Hardware cuts off someone's arm in this issue, some goon will reference it later in the run. This attention to detail is appreciated. He helps people, but it's secondary to his mission of revenge against Alva. Like the other Milestone characters, Hardware gets an arc. He starts off with a plan of revenge, but widens his horizons. He starts becoming a little bit more selfless and heroic instead of sticking to one goal without fully diving into full-on Boy Scout territory. This one book alone has a lot of character development compared to some long-running Cape and Cowl books. In the back of Hardware Number 1 is a preview for Milestone's next book, Blood Syndicate. Originally, the book was written by Dwayne McDuffie and Ivan Velez Jr. Black Lightning co-creator Trevor Von Eden does the art for the first issue. By number 5, Velez Jr. fully takes over writing duties with Criss Cross as the main artist. The book stays pretty consistent with this creative team, with random gaps through the run. Velez and Criss Cross work very well together too. It was the first real uh, job I had. Plus, it was really it was a big family atmosphere. Basically, right from the beginning, told me what it was going to be like being a, a brother in in the medium, and how you have to let your art speak for you, but you don't say nothing, so you shouldn't have to explain a thing. They knew I had a fire in me to make sure that what I'm doing had to be better than everybody else's. These guys were like kind of formed my way of thinking, the way the industry may be. So I kind of thought it was like that everywhere at one point. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to see my old stuff. But again, it's, I, I, I look at it and I, I, there's a lot of regret, although there's a lot of pride. And there's a lot of um, joy when I read the stories and kind of like remember how good it was when I was doing it and how great it was and the feeling of community and going to the office and being um, all like uh, lovey-dovey with everyone and, and just enjoying the work and the mission um, of getting these comics of color out there. Uh, new superheroes, creating more Latino and trans and, and, you know, gay and lesbian characters than anyone else has ever done before us. The Big Bang wiped out some of the gangs in Dakota City. Some of the members who survived got powers and joined the Blood Syndicate. Like Hardware, it's mostly an anti-hero book. They're against costumed heroes, but also take down crack houses throughout Paris Island. So they're helping people, but also taking the money from their raids for themselves. There's a lot of soap opera in the superhero gang comic. Seeing as it's an ensemble comic, there are a lot of personalities clashing. 
they're not perfect and each character gets space for development. Some characters feel entitled to lead the group, others are lost and have nowhere to go, some of them struggle with addiction. At first, there's so much mystery with the group. They're all from different cultural backgrounds and have a variety of powers. Controlling fire, absorbing electricity, turning back time. One of them is a talking dog. No special powers, just D-O-G-G -G dog. Velas Jr. and Criss Cross really made Blood Syndicate their own. Despite the gang violence, superpowered calamity, and bickering between the group members, the book is spent exploring cultural identity amongst young people who find solace with each other when they've been ostracized by the outside. They're not a superhero team, they're 100% a gang. While they're tightly knit, the Blood Syndicate hides secrets from each other. There's an issue where an emotional vampire named Demon Fox reveals everyone's backstories and origins. Some of the reveals are aspects of identity each member struggles with. The shapeshifter Masquerade is revealed to be a trans man. In the series, he can change his features or turn into any animal but chooses to present himself as a man. Fade, who can fly and go through objects, is revealed to be gay. During a time of stigma, they hide these aspects of themselves from their teams and communities. Seeing that Velas Jr. is out himself makes these stories feel personal. Outside of the Edge and Violence, Blood Syndicate is about embracing one's identity. They're not perfect or always inspiring, but that's what makes their story engaging. It's revealed early on that the gas that gave the team their powers might also end up killing them. So the book feels like a race against time. While the Blood Syndicate stories are strong and still hold up, Velas Jr. has stepped away from mainstream comics and focuses on his own independent projects. I have uh, mixed feelings about this, of course. Because, uh, you know, now that I'm at this age, that I did this stuff more than 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, um, it makes me wonder if this was, that was uh, time well spent. Uh, I'm thinking that maybe I should have stayed with my own stuff. Uh, if I would have stayed at Hedrick Martin, for instance, and continue with Tales of the Closet and try to do my own independent stuff, probably would have been better for me, um, considering that my... My career in mainstream comics was kind of traumatic at best. <laughs> um, knowing that I probably won't get any royalties or any kind of like digital payments for the stuff they repeat, knowing that I probably won't get credit for characters I created, like uh, like in the Static Shock uh, cartoon series, I get no credit for or payment for Aqua Maria. Um, how there's a little bit of erasure going on of my part of, of Milestone. Um, and how, when it led to my career in Marvel, and Marvel was kind of the worst traumatic experience I ever had. There's no pension plan. They're probably going to do movies. I'm not going to be part of that. No payments at all. Um, it feels weird. Mainstream comics sucks. They do. If you're a creator or a cartoonist or a writer or artist, and you work in mainstream artists, my dog agrees to and it's particularly in the 90s even before that your life or your retirement pretty much sucks <laughs> because there's no connection there's no payment there's no um there's no glory no flowers <laughs> but anyway john paul leon his stuff was really good um md bright all these wonderful artists are in here um, and the story still holds up Icon's name might be on the cover of this book, but his partner Rocket is the soul of this series. There is so much heart in Icon by Dwayne McDuffie and M.D. Bright. It's visually one of the most striking milestone books, which is thanks to Bright's powerful artwork. Icon follows attorney Augustus Freeman. Freeman was originally an alien whose pod crash landed on Earth before the Civil War. His pod made him look like a baby using the DNA of a slave woman who found and raised him meaning he was raised as a slave. When he grew up, he became part of the Underground Railroad and fought alongside the Union during the Civil War. At some point, he married and developed his own law practice, which he continues to run into the modern day. Icon stopped aging at a certain point, so as time passes, he pretends to be his own son to avoid suspicion. One night, a young woman named Raquel Irvin and her friends tried to rob Freeman's mansion. Raquel sees something that would change her life, a bulletproof man who can fly. 
Instead of having the kids arrested, Freeman lets them go with a warning. Raquel becomes inspired and comes back the next day with the idea of Icon, a symbol who can use his powers to inspire others. She also comes up with a name for herself, Rocket. Where Hardware and Blood Syndicate have an edgier look and tone for their stories, MD Bright's artwork just looks heroic. Each art style fits each book perfectly. Bright didn't just draw the book, he wrote and drew entire issues throughout the run. Icon and Rocket's world wouldn't be the same without Bright's involvement. Freeman is characterized as a conservative. McDuffie is a hardcore liberal. Again, this adds to how each milestone book brings a different flavor. My biggest issue generally in writing mainstream comics is if you write a black character, he represents blackness. And that's ridiculous. That's way too much, way too complex, way too much weight for any character, any single character to hold. Whereas if you write a white character, he's that guy. You know, you can be Superman, you can be Lex Luthor, but if you're black, you're all black people, good guy, bad guy, anything in between. So one of the things that we tried to do was present a range of characters, different socioeconomics, different backgrounds, uh, different ages, as, as much of a range of opinions as you can in a little tiny model of the world, not even as much range as there is in my own family but certainly more range than we had ever seen in comics before where to that point all we had seen was black exploitation movies of the 70s filtered through white creators. There are multiple moments where Icon uses the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps line. It's through Raquel who inspires him to use his resources to help others that he becomes more selfless. Raquel's liberal views rub off on Icon throughout the run. The more they work together, the more Icon expands his horizons. In the first issue, Raquel calls Freeman out by saying, quote, It's a lot easier to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, Mr. Man, if you already know how to fly. Unquote. Freeman opens up to the idea of Icon after that. Soon after, Icon and Rocket go out and take down crooks and superpowered thugs. It's because of Raquel, Icon even exists to begin with. She inspired Augustus Freeman to take up the mantle and use his powers to help people. It has that classic superhero storytelling with the deeper commentary on race and politics that McDuffie never shied away from. It feels kind of wrong to call Icon just Black Superman. It's limiting to his character. While their origins and powers are similar, there are topics that Superman would just never go near. Icon number one is also the first reference to the larger DC universe with the line, I bet this never happens to Superman in reference to Icon and Rocket trying to help police with the hostage situation, but are immediately labeled as targets. There's an entire arc that deals with abortion, where Raquel, who is 15 at the start of the run, is deciding whether she should keep her baby. Icon, being who he is, initially encourages Raquel to have an abortion. She's the one who decides to have the baby, which actually surprises Icon. Raquel is fascinating because she adds a new layer to the teenage superhero trope. Here's where comic book stories start bleeding into the real world. According to both Dwayne McDuffie and filmmaker Reginald Hudlin, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is a fan of Icon. McDuffie wrote an entire blog post about how he discovered that Thomas had every issue of Icon and would even quote the comic in his speeches. McDuffie was not jazzed about this because his political views and Thomas's don't match up at all. Look, I'm politically to the left of, well, everybody, actually, McDuffie wrote in 2000. This whole book is about someone from the new generation inspiring someone who is set in his ways to help and inspire others. Icon is a mentor to Rocket just as she is a mentor to him. Icon and Rocket are a package deal. Definitely Milestone's dynamic duo. Static needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. Before he became a sparky superhero, Virgil Ovid Hawkins was just a high schooler in Dakota City. He was one of the people caught in the Big Bang on Paris Island which gave him his powers. Virgil used his powers to help others with some growing pains as he learned how to be a hero. The character was created by the Milestone founders and Christopher Priest. Dwayne McDuffie joined writer Robert L. Washington on the early issues before Washington took over the book himself. The artist in the early days of Static was of course John Paul Leon. Co-founder Michael Davis had a big role in Static's development and Leon's involvement on the book. Leon was part of Michael Davis's Bad Boy Studio, a mentoring program for artists who want to break into comics. 
According to a blog post by Davis, he handpicked Leon to work on Static after being impressed by Leon's work. Apparently, Davis himself was supposed to draw Static before he replaced himself with Leon. Davis said in 2021, when John Paul Leon came into my mentor program, it wasn't long before I decided his style was better suited for Static than my frequent photo reference technique. Leon's art adds so much to the world despite only drawing 9 out of the 45 original issues. It's an energetic, youthful, kinetic style that meshes well with a young hero like Virgil Hawkins. That character design is so recognizable. Black suit with white electric bolts and the black Malcolm X cap. The iconic trench coat isn't introduced until the second issue. Leon left Static and became the artist on a new milestone title called Shadow Cabinet and stayed on that for a majority of the 18 issues. After Leon left, it took a few issues for Static to find a new artist, but Wilfred Santiago, aka Wilfred, took over for a majority of the book with number 11. Jeffrey Moore followed Wilfred and was the Static artist for the home stretch. For the most part, Leon's energy inspired a big chunk of the series, even after his departure. The thing about Davis is that there's no Static without him. Too much of that character is based on his life and family. The following are quotes from 2021. As an example, I wore many hats at Milestone, owner, founder, head of publicity, talent, and conventions. Nevertheless, I was only paid for writing and drawing Static, known to the world as Static Shock. I created the Static Shock universe. The model for that creation was my family. Gene, Robert, and Sharon were the names of my mom, dad, and sister. Hawkins was my cousin's last name. Initially, Alan Hawkins was Static's alter ego's name. Wayne changed it to Virgil after the civil rights pioneer. Static is more grounded, helps the little people, takes time to connect and engage where the other milestone characters are larger in scale. They protect the world while Static protects his little corner of Dakota City. Static explores the little moments of growing up while having powers. I won't dive too deep into his story because Static gets more screen time later. Not only are these stories different than what was coming out at the time, they look different too. Milestone Comics used a painted color style they called Milestone 100 Color Process. It was a style established by colorist and Milestone color editor Noelle Giddings, who is a key player in the way these books looked. Giddings and Dennis Cowan worked together at Marvel on Black Panther with Marvel Fanfare number 60 before Milestone. They shared studio space together at some point before then too. The painted color gives the Milestone stories a handmade look. This is significant with the way other mainstream comics were colored, especially with the four color process comics printers used. Giddings is the best person to explain her role at Milestone. Quote, When we started at Milestone, I was the color editor and it was my job to work on how the books and the whole universe should look color wise. Skin tones, costumes, power effects, the city of Dakota, the bridge, the characters' homes, Static's lightning bolt and jacket in school, all of it. I pictured the books with a natural and real feel color-wise. Not a slick or limited palette, just kind of real. And so it seemed that the best thing to do was to leave out the computer and the person in between, the slick effects, etc. I thought if we painted the pages and they were the original camera-ready art to be shot and printed from, we would get that feel for the Milestone universe," Giddings said in 2024. There's a big difference in the way the four color system worked in comics versus the Milestone 100 color process. I'll use an image of MD Bright icon art with colors by Giddings. Now here is an image of Housestyle DC art from the Worlds Collide crossover. Just looking at them, the difference is pretty apparent. Most superhero comics were colored like the one on the right, where Milestone went for the painted look. Here's a 60s comic to give a look at how coloring changed over the decades. Whether it's in the original issues or reprints, the actual brush strokes can be seen in a way that can't be seen in mainstream superhero comic art unless someone were to look at the original art. Quote, The only thing is that the newsprint the books were printed on was the cheapest of paper and sucked up all the ink, so the printed pages never got to look as amazing, bright, and colorful as the originals. But printing was about the cost and also was up to DC. That was part of the deal with Milestone. Getting said in 2024. As Milestone brought in a new age of heroes, there were stories that took shots at older comics. I talked about the history of Luke Cage in my Billy Graham essay and his roots due to the popularity of black exploitation films in the 70s. 
let's talk about icon number 13 featuring buck wild mercenary man it features a full-on 70s marvel style parody of a black exploitation style cage ripoff in the modern day which is to say the early 90s complete with credits boxes with those excessive marvel nicknames and corny dialogue the story with md bright's powerful art and duane mcduffie's perceptive writing looks at the past of black superheroes and how they've developed up until milestone Reading a Milestone book and going back to a 70s Luke Cage comic is a jarring difference. It serves to show how far superhero storytelling has come with Milestone's help. Also, Icon and Rocket aren't running around saying, Sweet Christmas, or how their skin is as hard as tungsten. It's mostly a scathing parody that ends up admitting how these 70s characters were at the start of something. And there were two things going on there. One was they wanted to curse like Shaft did. Mm. And they couldn't because it was comics, it was for kids. But the other thing was a uh, well-intentioned attempt at making the language real. Um, Archie Goodwin, one of the greatest writers and editors in, in comic book history, uh, worked on Luke Cage early on. And he decided that he would base his Luke Cage on real black detective fiction. And he chose Chester Himes. Mm -hmm. Now, Chester Himes, what a lot of people didn't realize, and certainly what the uh, French, uh, <laughs> what, what, what the uh, what, what the French people who declared him a genius, writing about the raw reality of life in Harlem, uh, didn't realize, was that Chester Himes was screwing with people. He made up this cartoon Harlem where he could write black comedy in, in the classic sense, not in the sense of comedies about blacks, but in in a in very dark comedy, mm. and the language was his little joke. He was making up a sort of ridiculous patois. Some of the people involved in early Luke Cage didn't get the joke, like a lot of people didn't get the joke, although when you call your uh, novel like Blind Man with a Pistol, it's kind of a hint, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but they thought, oh, this is the real deal. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get that language. Buck Wild makes a few appearances throughout Icon. In issue number 30, Icon gives a heartfelt speech at his funeral. It felt like putting an old era to rest. Those 70s stories weren't meant to be embarrassing, but instead heroes to root for. It's just that there is no game plan for non-white characters in comics. Cage is a product of his time who also modernized with the times. Milestone acknowledges that Luke Cage and these black 70s characters were part of a lineage that in a way led to Milestone media. It's poking fun, but acknowledging the history of black heroes in comics. The stories, while corny, were simple. Help the people in your community and beat up the bad guys. It's an honorable start. In the original Milestone stories, the Dakotaverse's connection to the DC Universe is almost non-existent at first. In the Dakotaverse, Batman and Superman exist like they do in our world in comics, on screens, or as merch. This sticks with Milestone's desire to control the direction of their own stories instead of relying on Batman cameos. Characters will casually make Superman references. There's the famous moment in Icon where he and Rocket are ganged up on by cops while trying to help people. Our readers will notice Batman and Icon posters on the wall in Static's room. It takes thousands of pages for Milestone and the DC Universe to actually come together. In 1994, DC and Milestone traded toys in an interdimensional crossover called Worlds Collide. Hardware, Icon, Blood Syndicate, and Static collided with Superman, Steel, and Superboy for hundreds of pages. A post office worker named Fred is able to travel between the DC Universe and Dakotaverse when he dreams. He's the only person who exists in both universes. It turns out that he can bring parts of one universe to the other one. He can also make anything he imagines a reality. There are some who want to use and exploit this too. This level of power makes Fred go insane and turns him into this giant blue interdimensional godlike creature called Rift. Also, he doesn't have a face and his hairline starts on the back of his head for some reason. His power is merging universes and making anything he wants a reality. It gets a bit jarring seeing characters drawn by Dennis Cowan and M.D. Bright go to the DC house style with standard four color. Seeing John Bogdanov drawing Milestone characters is a bit of a trip. Yes, the Milestone books are filled with superhero tropes, but each story feels philosophical and socially relevant. Going from a painted coloring style to standard four color comics makes a big difference. 
So with Milestone and DC Universes combined, but only Superman, Steel, and Superboy appear. Wonder Woman appears for a single panel. Although, it is fun seeing Rocket, Static, and Superboy team up. If one person from DC would have stayed in the Dakotaverse, Superboy would be a good choice. There's also a great issue where the Blood Syndicate gangs up on Superman because he got too close to their turf. They don't realize he's the real one and think he's just some guy dressed up as Big Blue. The best part of Worlds Collide is seeing how the Milestone characters interact with the more vibrant and silly DC ones. Like when Rocket mentions how everything looks like it's the Jetsons. The Superman theme stories try to emulate the Milestone themes, but it feels corny in an endearing way. It's understandable seeing as Superman is supposed to appeal to general audiences with its broad stroke storytelling. The themes in Milestone tend to shoot for the heart, not afraid of commenting on what mainstream readers would find uncomfortable or controversial. Some of Milestone's social themes are watered down in the DC issues. It shows the limits of how far DC was willing to go when covering race or other topics in comics. The event is at least over 400 pages, so it lets both houses take their time with each character. The only thing that feels rushed is the ending, where things very quickly go back to how they were. Both universes continue to reference Worlds Collide after the fact, though. Milestone stopped publishing comics in 1997 due to sales and marketing issues. Books like Static, Icon, and Hardware ended on cliffhangers where Blood Syndicate was lucky to have a finale in number 35 from 1996. Despite Milestone ending its comics line in 1997, those stories are endlessly relevant and rereadable today. While DC had distribution rights of Milestone titles and that Worlds Collide crossover, Milestone's titles stand strong in its own bubble. The original Milestone line feels like its own beast. It doesn't have the confusion other superhero titles have. For instance, 100 Amazing Spider-Man or X-Men titles that have to follow different continuities, or multiple volume ones that kick off a new series with the same character. These act as new reader repellent. The original Milestone was an age that still stands strong on its own. Milestone didn't stay down after 1997. Instead, the Dakotaverse took on a new form going from comic pages to TV screens in the form of the Static Shock cartoon in 2000. A new decade and a new form for Milestone. Dwayne McDuffie during this time fully embraced working in animation and worked regularly in shows like Justice League, Ben 10, and other DC animated projects. Milestone didn't stay out of the comics game for long. With the Static Shock series, Virgil Hawkins got a new series called Rebirth of the Cool in 2001, which ran for four issues. It picks up after the last issue of the original Static series, explaining that Virgil has been retired. McDuffie and John Paul Leon came back to work on the series, which makes it feel more official. The Static Shock cartoon might have been a lot of people's first introduction to the Milestone universe. Virgil Hawkins is the perfect character to bring into animation. Some of the themes and characters were changed around, but that makes sense given the cartoon was originally made for a younger audience, even though it still covers serious issues. The original Static comic is less all ages, but still very accessible for fans of the cartoon. It's just that a lot of the comics history is condensed for the series. I won't break down the entire series in detail since I'd rather focus on the creators and comics. The series took place in the DC Animated Universe, or DCAU, and ran from 2000 to 2004. The show was sadly cancelled due to poor merch sales, but it made the Herculean effort of keeping the spirit of the Milestone world alive. You know, it wasn't a Disney property, it wasn't a Nickelodeon property, yet it had this huge audience. So I look at that as like, wow, that's enormously successful, and that will be successful again in some other media. The Milestone creators continued to produce other projects. The characters lived on through licensing and DC projects like the Young Justice animated series. Rocket, Icon, Static, Hardware, and Holocaust made appearances throughout the series, once again mixing the Dakotaverse and the DC Universe. This is a big deal since Milestone doesn't always license out its characters. In 2010, the Dakotaverse and original creators came back for one last hurrah with a two-issue series called Milestone Forever. Dwayne McDuffie, John Paul Leon, M.D. Bright, Dennis Cowan, Chris Cross, and other Milestone OGs reunited to wrap up the stories that were left hanging in the original Milestone run in 1997. It's like a comics homecoming, but also bittersweet. While the Milestone creators reunited for these issues, 
McDuffie would unfortunately pass away a year later from difficulties during a heart operation on February 21st, 2011. His outspoken work in comics and animation is still powerful and impactful. While Milestone stories lived on after Dwayne McDuffie's death in 2011, the comics medium definitely lost a pioneer. He wasn't even up there in years so his passing was too soon. Luckily, his legacy, along with Milestone stories, live on through the comics themselves and the efforts of the remaining founders and fans. Milestone went under the radar for a while. In 2015, a Milestone relaunch was announced by filmmaker and comics writer Reginald Hudlin, with Milestone co-founders Dennis Cowan and Derek T. Dingle. Dwayne McDuffie's widow, Charlotte McDuffie, sued Hudlin, Cowan, and Dingle in 2017. The lawsuit stated that McDuffie's estate was left out of the new Milestone deal by the remaining founders. In the lawsuit documents, it stated that McDuffie owned 50% of Milestone Media at the time of his death. A settlement was reached with Charlotte McDuffie in 2019, however the details weren't released. With the lawsuit settled, Milestone finally made its return in 2020. The guys had a lot of success, and then they kind of left the company, and then one of the founders passed away six years ago. Oh no and they asked me to speak at the memorial service because I've been friends with them since they started. So after the service, they came to me and said, Reggie, I don't know what we'd be doing. We need you to step in and we're gonna restart the company. Mm. And we want you to be one of the three guys. So I said, let's go. With the revival, Cowan returned to hardware, Criss Cross went back to Blood Syndicate, Hudlin, Milestone's most recently added head honcho, took over writing Icon and Rocket and some other books. There's a mix of the old guard and newer creators with the revival. Milestone didn't hold back on telling stories just because it focused on superheroes and comics. It didn't limit itself or hold back when telling stories about underrepresented groups or social issues that didn't get discussed in comics. Milestone hit at the right place at the right time, especially with how relevant and rereadable those stories are today. In an industry with stories that have a lot of homogeny, the world needs more Milestone. There were so many brilliant characters that were created uh, in that era that those characters have to come back. They have to be revisited and moved forward. And I know that through Milestone, we've been able to do some comics, create some characters, and work with people, underrepresented people, and that's been a big, big joy for me. What I will say is what Milestone got out of the deal was distrib uh, distribution pretty much unmatched by any other black company ever. Uh, we did somewhere between 250 and 300 comics, which is probably equal to the output of every other black publisher combined. Uh, we sold a lot more comics than anybody else, you know, just from the, from the weight of being in the stores every week. We maintained total creative control. This essay is a sequel and companion to the artist Billy Graham one I did. They both connect, so I recommend watching both. All of the sources I used, like the interviews, articles, milestone lawsuit documents, and research on MOVE are included in the video description or at the bottom of the essay on my website for further perusal. As always, the transcripts for my essays are available on my website, witsandpod.com. My other work is on there as well. If it's not on there, it's not me. Check out my other essays, spread the word. Sadly, icon artist and co-creator MD Bright passed away during the editing of this essay on March 27th, 2024. His art was definitely a highlight of those milestone stories. Bright's run with Icon made that book one of the most consistent looking milestone titles and sold the heroic spirit of the character. Chaos ensues.